Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, today's webinar uh, called Working Together to Prevent Youth Suicide, the Power of Communication. My name is Dr. Pilar Rio Seco. I'm a research fellow in the Longitudinal Studies, um, Longitudinal and Life Course Studies unit here at the Australian Institute of Family Studies. I work mainly on the Longitudinal Study of Australian Children and the Building Nightly Life in Australia, which is the Longitudinal Study of Humanitarian Migrants. I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land where we meet today. I'm lucky to be up here in uh, sunny Townsville, where the traditional custodians are the Bindal and Wuguru Gaba people. I pay much respect to these elders, the elders past and present, and to the elders from other communities who may be participating today from all around Australia. In today's webinar, we're going to talk about approaches that are being used to um, support the prevention of suicide among young people and how to minimize the difficult experiences of communities following um, suicide. Our presenters today will talk us through uh, what's the most up-to-date evidence-based research in regards to suicide pre and post intervention. We'll also discuss some key risk factors uh, for young people, particularly in the context of COVID-19. And we're also going to discuss some uh, very exciting strategies that are happening today, including the chat safe guidelines that have been decided to support young people to help others uh, or help themselves. Joining me today for our discussion, we have Dr. Luis Lasala. Hello, Luis. Luisa currently works at the Suicide Prevention Unit at Origin Youth Health in Victoria. She's interested on the so social and psychological impact that digital technologies can have on young people, and particularly the role of, that social media can play in youth suicide prevention. We also have today joining us, Emily Bubis. Hi, Emily. Hi. Emily is a mental health Advocacy, oh, advocate, sorry. Uh, she's got a background on psychology and she became an advocate when she joined the youth advisory group at Headspace. And she's been working in the e health space and a huge range of peer support um, programs. So it's going to be a great discussion today. Uh, we're going to have some really good insights on programs that are being successfully developed here in, in Victoria or there in Victoria, I should say. Um, and a lot of the resources that are going to be discussed to, in today's webinar are available for you in the CFCA event page, so make sure you uh, access those resources. There are not many slides in this presentation, but um, Louise has a few and they have been made available in the resource section, the handout section. Uh, so you can access that uh, with the other resources. I'll now hand over you to you, uh, Louise, and Louise is going to talk talk us through some new pre and post suicide intervention research. Thanks, Louise. Awesome. All right, thanks, Pilar. Um, so as Pilar said, I'm Louise um, and I'm a research assistant on the youth suicide prevention team at Origin here in Melbourne. Um, I'm currently working on a universal suicide prevention project, which is known as ChatSafe. Um, and I will speak a little bit about ChatSafe shortly. Um, but today I'm going to speak briefly on the current youth, situa youth suicide situation here in Australia. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about some of the work that we're doing in the prevention and the postvention space at Origin. Um, and I'm going to wrap up with a little bit of an intro to chat, Dave, um, and introduce to you one of the resources that we have recently um, launched, which is designed to help communities who have been bereaved by a suicide. Um, so on the next slide you will see a graph um, depicting the Australian suicide rates over the last um, 10 decades, sorry, last 10 years um, for those under the age of 25. And so um, on that graph, sorry, I just can't see. Yep, perfect. Um, so on that graph, you'll see the males are the blue line um, and female suicides are depicted on the red line. And I suppose what this graph shows us um, quite clearly is that suicide rates have steadily increased over the last 10 years. Um, and as I'm sure a lot of you know, suicide is the leading cause of death for young Australians. 
Um, and in fact, for those who are aged 15 to 19, um, in the last decade, suicide has almost doubled for that age group. Um, now, this graph is already just slightly out of date as the ABS did release their causes of death data last Friday, so just after I had already submitted these slides. Um, but what that told us was that in 2019, there were 3,318 deaths by suicide in Australia last year. And of those, sorry, 480 of them were under the age of 25. Um, and in fact, 19 were under the age of 14. And these numbers are an increase in the numbers that were recorded in 2018. Um, the ABS data also um, uh, reported that for those under the age of 18, there were three um, top psychosocial risk factors um, for suicide, and they were a personal history of self-harm, a disruption of family by separation and divorce, um, or problems in relationships with significant others, so partners and spouses. Um, so with suicide rates in Australia, particularly with, particularly with young people, um, there is a lot of talk and a lot of attention towards the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had or will have on young people um, in regards to suicide rates and their mental health more generally. Currently, there is no data to support a rise in suicide rates as a result of the pandemic. Um, however, we have seen a 33% increase in presentations to self sorry, in presentations to emergency departments with self-harm injuries by young people. Um, and as we just saw with the ABS data, we know that previous histories of self-harm is a risk factor for future suicidal behaviour. Um, Joe Robinson, so Associate Professor Joe Robinson leads the suicide prevention team here in, or, at Origin, um, and she's part of a Centre for Research Excellence with colleagues at the Brain and Mind Centre in Sydney. Um, and through some dynamic modelling, they've estimated that by the time we do get to the end of the um, pandemic and once the social, the economic and the financial impacts are truly felt by young people, that we may expect to see an increase of up to 30% in youth suicide rates over the next five years. Um, and I think that really speaks to the urgency and the need for appropriate, effective and youth-friendly suicide prevention um, and postvention initiatives um, so that we are doing our best to keep the young people in our lives um, and the young people that we work with as safe as possible. Um, so the work we do at the suicide prevention team obviously aims to reduce youth suicides and we do that um, kind of being underpinned by the principles of access, evidence and empowerment. Um, and we really aim to strengthen the evidence base around suicide prevention research across a range of different settings. Um, the other thing that kind of really underpins the work that we do at Origin um, is the involvement of young people. So if you are aware of any of our projects or any of the work that is currently being conducted, you will be aware that at the forefront of all of our work are young people. And we try to include young people from the very beginning of the work that we do all the way through to the end. Um, now, when it comes to youth suicide prevention and postvention, we know that there is no one size fits all. Um, and we know that we do need to work across settings um, and, and deliver interventions in a whole range of different ways so that we do reach all of the individuals that we are trying to target. Um, so you'll see here on the screen that we start off with universal interventions. Um, universal interventions are the kinds of things that we can deliver across a community, regardless of the level of risk. Um, so here we're looking to reduce, reduce risk factors and increase protective factors across an entire community. And this could be through things like awareness raising campaigns um, or embedding, I suppose, within the school curriculum, um, mental health or suicide prevention initiatives. Then we move into slightly more specific um, types of interventions. And this one's referred to as selective interventions. Uh, and here we're looking to target those who are at a higher level of risk. So when it comes to selective interventions, it's really about case detection and screening and responding to those who may have suicidal thoughts. Um, one of the projects that we are currently running within the team um, is doing this across schools in the northwest of Melbourne currently. Um, and the literature suggests that these sort of approaches can identify anywhere between four and 45% of young people who may otherwise have slipped through the cracks. Um, or who may not have sought help. So they're useful ways to reach young people before they've reached out for help or in case they don't. Um, then we move into the pointiest end of these interventions and that is indicated interventions. And here 
these individuals, uh, sorry, these interventions are for individuals who are already showing signs of suicidality, um, who have persistent challenges with suicidality, or who may have made a suicide attempt. Um, and these indicated individuals interventions are activities that are embedded within clinical services um, or are embedded within emergency departments to really respond to that level of risk at that point in time. Now some of the team that I've worked with have published a systematic review on this and in that review they really look to see what works with young people um, in terms of youth suicide prevention and specifically within education settings um, and what they found is that there are a number of individuals interventions that are rolled out and they're rolled out across a number of different settings however there isn't a lot of consistency um, in those interventions or in the way that they are delivered the other thing that's a kind of a key issue when it comes to youth suicide prevention initiatives or, or trying to work out what is best practice is that there's no um, well there's not a lot of comprehensive or robust studies that are conducted so it's quite difficult to run kind of a gold standard or a randomized controlled trial study in youth suicide prevention um, because suicides aren't all that common and it can be difficult for a whole range of methodological reasons to run that sort of study um, but to overcome some of that what we're doing at the suicide prevention team at Origin is trying to develop best practice guidelines or trying to um, come up with findings for each of these interventions across a whole range of settings so that we can inform the way that we do um, tailor youth suicide prevention interventions. So I mentioned earlier that ChatSafe is, a, is one of our biggest projects and that is a universal project that is attempting to deliver youth suicide prevention um, through social media and we're trying to reach a large number of young people across Australia. I also mentioned that we are running a large project um, in schools across the northwest of Melbourne um, and that is both a universal and a selective approach kind of tied into one. Um, and there my colleagues are trying to educate young, so year 10 students with some safe talk training and that's to make them better equipped in talking and communicating and identifying risks of suicide in themselves and in others. And throughout that process, they're also hoping to identify some students who are at risk um, and ensure that they get the um, support that they require. We also have some colleagues who are running some gatekeeper training currently. So for any parents, of those aged 12 to 25 in Victoria. We're currently running some um, training for parents, some suicide alertness training, sorry, so that they also are better equipped in identifying signs of risk in the young people in their lives. Um, some of the researchers in our team are also doing work in emergency departments. Um, and we've also got a smaller study that's looking at young people's experience of um, presenting to emergency departments after they've had an ep a, a series or sorry a, an episode of self-harm um, or a suicidal crisis. So there's lots of work being done in this space um, and recently we've also submitted a report to the National Mental Health Commission um, and in that report we've really tried to emphasise the importance of including young voices or including young, young people's experiences in not only um, seeking help um, but also in what they have found helpful or unhelpful along the way. Now across all of these um, interventions is also the consideration of postvention models. So um, postvention is activities that are put into place to protect individuals or communities following the suicide death um, or when a community has been bereaved by a suicide. Um, and the reason that postvention models are so important is because they aim to reduce the risk of contagion um, or the risk of further suicide deaths within that community. Now, when it comes to young people, we know that exposure to um, peer suicides or to other youth suicides can be linked to things such as feelings of guilt, um, depression, suicidal ideation within themselves um, and symptoms of PTSD. Um, and we also know that young people are more susceptible to being involved in a suicide cluster when um, compared to adults. So even though suicide clusters are quite rare, they do happen more commonly among young people. Um, and after a suicide has occurred, this is when young people are at the greatest risk. Um, and this is particularly true of those within school settings or education settings. So um, when it comes to the gold standard postvention approaches, here we would look to things like the Headspace, um, Headspace in Schools or the BU Postvention Toolkit, which you can find on their, on their websites. 
Um, and again, these documents or these postvention toolkits speak to the need to have a postvention um, initiative in place ready to go if and when a suicide does occur and so that you can offer support to your students or support to your communities immediately. Um, one of the resources that we've released this year um, is called the Chat Safe Guide for Communities or we refer to it as the Clusters resource um, and it's a guide for using social media following um, a suicide of a young person and to help prevent suicide clusters or to mitigate that risk of further suicides um, occurring. Um, now the Chat Safe Clusters resource is an example of a postvention approach that communities, schools or organisations could use um, to help disseminate information quickly um, and to share information across social media to reach a large number of people in a short space of time. Um, now before I go into the guide, um, on the next slide, please. Um, for those of you that don't know ChatSafe, um, the ChatSafe guidelines are the world's first evidence-informed tools and tips designed to help young people communicate safely online about suicide. So we knew that um, young people were talking about suicide online, we were aware that suicide related content was being seen online, um, but there weren't any guidelines or any best, best practice tips on what to do if you do see that content or how to handle or manage that content. So the ChatSafe guidelines were developed in 2018 using a Delphi consensus methodology um, and they were developed in partnership with young people, suicide prevention experts and media professionals. And like I said, yep, they were developed in 2018. Now in order to bring the guidelines to life, we partnered with over 160 young people across Australia um, and in late 2019, we rolled out a nationwide suicide prevention social media campaign. Um, and we launched our ChatSafe um, Instagram account, Facebook account, Twitter, Tumblr, and Snapchat. Um, and through that campaign and, and through um, sharing information um, via social media, we managed to reach around 1.5 million young people across Australia with that information. Now, alongside the campaign, we also evaluated how helpful, how safe and how acceptable the content was. Um, and we're in the process of writing that up and hoping to submit that this week. Um, but what I will tell you is that the findings were very promising. So for the young people who do, did help us evaluate that content, most of them reported um, an increased capacity, ability and confidence in intervening against suicide related content online. Most of them reported an increased um, internet self-efficacy and inter, um, increased safety in terms of their behaviours online. So it's all pointing in the right direction and we are, like I said, hoping to publish that very soon. Now at the core of the ChatSafe, um, I suppose at the core of the ChatSafe project or fundamental to the ChatSafe um, approach is that social media can be used for good. So we know that there is a lot of fear and a lot of concern when it comes to social media and young people in particular. Um, and we know that adults and educators and parents are very concerned about the impact that social media might have on young people. However, in the work that we do with young people and in a lot of the literature, there's also a lot of evidence to point to the positive role social media can play in young people's lives. And at ChatSafe, we're looking to harness those positive um, impacts and use them um, to help spread positive and helpful and safe messaging around youth suicide. Um, now, the other thing is we know that social media does increase feelings of connectedness or belonging. We know that it's available to young people 24 seven. We know that young people feel comfortable and confident talking about their lives and their experiences and their feelings on social media. Um, and we also are looking in the future to see how social media could be used as a soft entry point for care. Um, now, why social media is so important, particularly in terms of it being part of a postvention strategy, is that we know that after a suicide has occurred, it's really important that helpful and appropriate information is disseminated in a timely manner. Um, and this is to support and provide help to those who have been directly impacted by a suicide, um, but it's also to minimise or limit the amount of gossip or the unsafe conversations or the unsafe or unhelpful language that sometimes occurs after a suicide has happened. So we know and the literature tells us that the way a suicide is discussed 
or the way a suicide is reported on, if, especially if it's unhelpful or unsafe, can be a, a really big risk factor for future suicidal behaviour in others. Um, and so that's why things like the Mind Fred guidelines and guidelines in other countries across the world on safe reporting of suicide are so important. However, the Mind Fred Mind Frame guidelines didn't really factor in social media and aren't really super relevant to young people. And so as we know, um, those who have social media or those who create content on social media are in charge um, and create that content themselves. And so guidelines to, or tips to um, safely do that were missing. And that's what the chat safe guidelines um, filled. That's the gap they filled. And that's the gap that this cluster's response or the chat safe guide for communities fills in terms of helping communities, workplaces or schools deliver and roll out a safe um, postvention approach using social media. Now, um, the, Guide for Communities does provide tangible tips on how to share information around help seeking. Um, it helps um, model safe language, so language tips to do and language things not to do. Um, it equips people within the community with the tools that they need to look after themselves, but more importantly also the tools that they need to look after others if they do identify other people as being at risk. Um, and it also helps provide some information on how communities can memorialise someone safely. So steering clear of things online that might sensationalise or glorify suicide, um, but paying tribute to someone in a safe way. Um, the guidelines also, sorry, the guide for communities also will talk you through how to target people in your community through paid advertising on social media. Um, it speaks a little bit about which social media platforms might be best to use. Um, and this really depends on who it is that you're trying to target and what age um, those people are. And it also speaks about how to develop meaningful content for the groups of people that you're trying, trying to reach with that safe information. Um, now off the back of this uh, guide for communities um, or this clusters resource, we're also currently um, running an evaluation on some clusters content that is being shared through the um, ChatSafe Instagram page at the moment. Um, and so there what we're doing is we're asking some young people who have been bereaved by a suicide recently to help us evaluate content to see if it was safe, to see if it was helpful, and to get their perspectives on what sorts of things they'd like to see, um, you know, rolled out through their schools or through their communities online um, in order to equip them um, with the tools and the, the tools and the things that they need to look after themselves and others after a suicide has occurred. Um, and the goal here is that we will develop a suite of content that communities can push out across their, um, their catchment areas, um, if you like, um, after a suicide has occurred so that they're ready to go and can offer help and support um, to the individuals there. Now, not so much of a postvention technique, but similar to this guide for communities, we've also just released a chat safe for educators resource. Um, and the chat safe for educators resource is very much aimed towards teachers or educators at a tertiary level um, about how they can have safe conversations with their students, um, but more importantly, how they can support their students to have safe conversations online. So we have heard from a number of school staff that they do become aware that conversations relating to self-harm and suicide are happening online so not necessarily to the teachers but the teachers are aware of them happening and this um, educators resource helps guide um, teachers and how to communicate um, about that with their students and how they can support their students to make sure that they're staying safe online as well. Now I could talk about chat safe for days and days and days but that's probably my cue to finish up. Um, and so I'm going to pass over to you now to Emily. Um, and Em was actually one of the young people who helped us out with the Chat Safe study and has been involved in a number of our Chat Safe activities. Um, and she is going to speak to you from the perspective of a peer worker. Thanks, Em. Thanks, Lou. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Lou mentioned, my name is Emily and I'm a young person connected to the Origin and Headspace Network. Currently, I'm a peer support worker at Headspace in Werribee, but I'm also an Origin Digital and Headspace liaison for moderated online social therapy. And I've been a part of several peer work related and non-peer work related projects with Origin as well, including the ChatSafe project. 
Before I begin, I'd just like to also pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land upon which we are gathered today. For myself, this is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to owners past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to any future young leaders that are present here with us today. Uh, for those that might not have heard of peer work or a peer support worker before, um, please allow me a few minutes of this presentation to explain my role at Headspace Werribee, but also peer work a bit more broadly. So in the mental health field, peer workers such as myself value our own lived experience and the lived experience of others to provide more wraparound support to people with ill mental health and facing various other challenges related to that, including vocational, social, social and emotional challenges. Uh, in short, peer work can be categorised as informal, naturally occurring. Sometimes you don't even notice that you're providing peer work to a friend or family member. Um, peer, peers working in specific peer run programs uh, and peers employed within traditional services like employment services, disability, mental health, uh, for example, Headspace and Origin. Uh, in our role as a peer worker, we draw on our own lived experience, relevant training and various supervision in order to support someone else's journey towards recovery, whatever that means to them. This has achieved a number of ways, including modelling certain behaviour, instilling hope in another person, encouraging and promoting resilience within them, support in taking ownership of one's life, focus on health, both physical and mental health, quality of life and advocate for change. In the mental health field, lived experience hasn't always been recognised as expertise or a learning opportunity. However, the sharing of lived experience is what equips peer workers with the unique skills to build connection, trust and rapport with other people, particularly young people, understand and interpret someone's mental health needs and gather insights into the mental health system in order to better advocate for change. Peer work is strengths-based, social and practical and is now more widely considered an integral component of the mental health system in particular. It's pretty reassuring to see that there have been increasing local, state and national efforts to support the growing peer workforce in Australia and to see similar efforts being undertaken in other countries such as New Zealand, the United Kingdom, the United States, Canada and Singapore. Uh, in the Origin Headspace Network, peer work is predominantly one-on-one, -on -one, but might also occur in a range of other settings as well, um, as well as other spe specialisations and modes. Uh, this can include primary care, community care, inpatient, outpatient care, post-discharge, vocational care, and as well as online. Uh, specifically in my role at Headspace Werribee, my day-to-day -day is extremely variable and can include a number of responsibilities such as one-on-one -on -one peer work, group facilitation, peer education, community awareness and the mentoring of our youth advocacy group, which is a group of young volunteers. Despite the progress of the last several decades, stigma associated with ill mental health still exists and is still prevalent in our community. The way that we talk about mental health, including what we state or share on social media, at home, at work, etc., uh, is therefore extremely important and can make a really strong difference towards reducing this stigma. Certain ways of talking about mental health can alienate members of our community or sensationalise or romanticise a particular mental health challenge. This can contribute significantly uh, to stigma and by extension discrimination, because while mental illness is common, it is still often extremely misunderstood. For example, uh, calling someone living with a mental health challenge deranged or psycho, while sensational, uh, describes behaviour that is inaccurate and implies the existence of a mental health challenge where one might not exist or is inappropriately represented. Further, using terminology such as victim or suffering in adjunct to mental health suggests a lack of quality of life for people living with a mental health challenge. Um, and a lot of this information can be found in the ChatSafe guidelines as Lou has already promoted. 
However, it's also important that we communicate about suicide appropriately and safely, especially when we're online. The ChatSafe guidelines provide a comprehensive overview on the importance of language when we talk about suicide. Specifically, they distinguish between helpful and unhelpful language and provide helpful alternatives to use when we talk about suicide and mental health more broadly. For example, um, the term committed suicide is unhelpful as it describes suicide as a criminal and sinful act and may suggest to a person that what they are feeling is wrong or unacceptable in some way. Further, it may make a person worry that they'll be judged if they ask or reach out for help. Instead, the phrase died by suicide is recommended by the ChatSafe guidelines. More broadly speaking, we want to avoid language that glamorizes, romanticizes, sensationalizes, or trivializes suicide, or makes it seem appealing or desirable. We should aim to use language that is non-descriptive and non-judgmental, such as avoiding using words or phrases such as successful, unsuccessful, failed attempt, or that suicide was achieved. However, while we recognize that language is important, we also need to be mindful that it can and will be extremely challenging to correct how we communicate. The myths and misconceptions associated with mental health have existed for decades, unchallenged, perpetuated, and normalized by wider societal culture. So it won't be easy to override how we communicate about mental health, but by educating ourselves, our colleagues, our community, et cetera, we can make really outstanding progress. So just going back to peer work, the ways in which peer work is delivered is entirely dependent on the needs of a young person. And in my role at Headspace Werribee, I've worked with young people both one-on-one -on -one and in a group-based group setting who are either currently experiencing suicidal thoughts or, or who have experienced with suicide in some way in the past. Regardless of how peer support is delivered, there are certain guiding principles that underpin the relationship between a young person and a peer worker, such as hope and recovery, mutual understanding, acceptance, respect and safety and connection. And these are really important guiding principles that underpin the nature of the work of a peer support worker. Uh, in my role, I always aim to provide a young person with a safe space to share their struggles and all their challenges. Uh, this space is always non-judgmental and based on res respect and acceptance. However, obviously keeping in mind that a young person's safety is always a first priority. Uh, establishing trust with a young person starts with listening and understanding a young person's situation and their experiences. Uh, this can include connecting over shared experiences such as ethnicity, cultural background, lifestyle, health, faith, sexual orientation and more. However, where this mutuality might not exist and it won't always exist with every young person that I meet or work with, it is important to connect to related thoughts, emotions, feelings, etc. above all else. While lived experience is a cornerstone of peer work, it is the diversity of lived experience of young people that is important to focus on and to utilize a specific skill set every day. There are certain skills that a peer worker can utilize, such as active listening. So actively listening, listening to a young person um, when speaking with them, um, being open to sharing and experiencing other worldviews and other perspectives, obviously always being supportive of a young person, um, maintaining a strengths-based focus, sharing experiences safely and appropriately, and being authentic in every interaction with a young person. Um, as I mentioned earlier, peer work can occur in many settings, including educational and community settings. Often community awareness and peer support staff at a local Headspace Centre will be asked by a community organisation or local school, for example, to give a presentation on a myriad of topics, including mental health literacy, help seeking, stress, etc. However, while we might present on one or more of the above, it is often the case where a, a teacher, community member, a student um, will either mention suicide or suicidality 
and ask Headspace staff to also present on suicide or may present a question related to suicide in some way. This can really quickly become a difficult, um, if not uncomfortable, situation to be in. However, there are many resources that we refer to in order to convey the most accurate and appropriate information, including the ChatSafe guidelines. Again, keeping in mind that young people's safety is always a priority. As Louise mentioned a little bit earlier, Headspace uh, in Schools um, is a program that um, Headspace National has that supports secondary schools um, in response to and to aid recovery where there has been the death of a young person in the school community. And a lot of the, the information around Headspace in Schools um, can be found um, on their website as well. Um, while community awareness and peer support staff can provide information and support related to suicide, complex questions and concerns um, are typically referred to enhanced care or senior access staff at a Headspace Centre or Headspace in schools where there's been the death of a young person specifically. So just in the last part of my presentation this afternoon, I just want to touch on why we don't or can't uh, talk about suicide and why most people, um, particularly parents, feel unequipped to have a conversation about suicide with a young person. Um, specifically when talking to a young person, why we can be scared of, of awkward silent breaks. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in my role as a peer support worker, I often work with young people in a one-on-one -on -one capacity. And it is not uncommon to experience a significant amount of silence or to receive only vague non-committal responses from a young person like, yeah, nah, or sure. Um, however, one thing that I've learned and learned to accept is that silence can be both advantageous and comfortable. Um, silence should be viewed as an opportunity to allow a young person to tell you how they're feeling or to express that something isn't right but also an opportunity to be present in the moment with a young person then and there. A young person might not have the exact words and you might not either, and that's okay, but just providing that physical and emotional space in that moment can be more than enough. It can be really frightening to have that conversation with a young person or start that conversation. However, I just want to note that you don't need to be a psycho psychological or medical professional in that moment. Uh, the most important thing to do is to listen, to validate and to reaffirm a young person of, of your support. Um, a young person might not be ready to have that conversation or want to seek help straight away. Reassuring them of your support, reminding them of help seeking options and listening to what they're telling you, either through their words or in their silence are the most important things to remember. Um, that brings me to the end of my formal presentation. Thank you so much to everyone for listening and for watching. Uh, I hope that you've learned something new and that there's something you can take away from this webinar and introduce either into your workspace or your home life or both. Um, thank you to Origin as well as the, the ChatSafe team for allowing me to present this afternoon. Um, and a massive shout out also to my team at Headspace Werribee. Thank you so much to everyone for watching um, and we'll now welcome both Louise and Pilar back onto the main screen. Thanks, Emily. And thanks, Louise. Uh, that was a uh, fascinating, very, very interesting stuff happening here in the space of suicide prevention, which is very great to hear. Um, we have lots of questions. Um, so, Without putting my questions first, I'm going to go straight to the audience. There was a few people asking about the um, suicide alertness training for parents. I actually had a question yep. on that too. How do people access this training um, and what what, yep. what setting does it happen? Perfect. So the suicide alertness training for parents, like I said, is currently only available to parents in Victoria. Um, and they do need to be parents of those age 12 to 25. 
Um, there's a few different ways that people can find some information about this. So it is on the Origin website. Um, alternatively, I'm more than happy to take emails and send you the research flyers and send out the research information as well. So um, on the very first slide of my presentation was my email address. Um, and feel free to reach out to either myself or through the website and I will get that information to you. Um, but the more parents that take part or the more, to, uh, more people that get to share that information with, the better. So yeah, that'd be great. Great, thanks Louis. Um, our next question is uh, for uh, both of you, Emily and, and Louise. It's about uh, resources targeted for um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people and, and, and communities. Do we have in Headspace or Origin any resources that are, uh, or in the peer workspace, Emily, that are um, specifically designed or targeted for these uh, community groups? Yeah, I think, I think that's been a major, um, major project that's been worked on, um, I know, by Headspace National at the moment. Uh, so it's sort of in the process of being worked on. Um, I know they're working on updating um, a lot of their resources targeted specifically to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, so they're just updating all that at the moment. Um, so it's sort of like a watch this space um, kind of uh, situation. But I know a lot of other organisations as well. Um, often, it, as I guess specifically in the peer workspace, um, yeah, try to um, recruit specifically Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander young people to work in the space for that community. Um, so they're really great resources as well. But in terms of um, like physical resources, um, that's something that Headspace National is working on at the moment. So yeah, unfortunately nothing right now, but hopefully really soon they can um, have all that, um, yeah, ready, ready to go. Yeah, great. Um, and I would echo that in terms of what Em said, and Origin is also working on some of those resources currently as well. Um, when it comes to youth suicide prevention though, involving Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, communities um, or organisations can be difficult. Um, obviously, the way different communities talk about suicide or the words that we use when we are referring to a suicide is different. Um, some of the content that is shared across the ChatSafe um, Instagram page um, has been designed and um, co-designed by some Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people who were involved in one of our workshops over in WA. Um, but again, it's a group that we are trying to actively um, over the next little while work with. Um, and it's something that we do know that we need to do better. Um, but we also want to make sure that it's safe and acceptable. Right. Thank you. Um, coming to the next question, a um, few people asking about information or resources on how to speak to, to young people who have lost a friend to, to suicide, so Emily or, or Louise, uh, if you can um, provide some uh, information there, it would be great. Did you want, Do you want to go first, Em? I can, yeah, I can. Um, yeah, I, I think just to echo, I guess, a little bit on what I've said. Um, it can be a really difficult conversation to have and a lot of people don't know how to start that conversation or um, yeah just be a part of that conversation but I think starting is always a really uh, really great thing to do and in terms of specific you know resources or information to draw from um, there are so many organizations that have um, yeah, specific resources on that, like Are You Okay, um, Beyond Blue, um, about how to start that conversation. But I think the most important thing to do in that conversation is to make sure you're in a, in a space, um, like physically, emotionally, where you can have that conversation um, and not knowing what to say is okay. I think that's a massive misconception. Um, you know, a lot of people are scared of saying the wrong thing um, or not saying the right thing at all um, or not being able to provide support then and there. But reaffirming someone that, um, you know, you're not going to just have this one off chat that you can, you know, check in a few times and, and be there for them. Maybe when they are a bit more ready to have a conversation um, is also really important to kind of communicate to a friend um, that might be going through that situation as well. So yeah, I think starting is a really great, really great thing to do, but it can be really uncomfortable or difficult uh, a conversation to have. But um, yeah, reassuring them that you're there for them um, when they're ready to come to you for help or support or a chat. Um, yeah, is really, really important to try to communicate to them. Yeah. Um, and I'd step in there and say as well that that's one of the goals of our current clusters resource 
um, and clusters social media study. So we are looking at developing content that does help people have those conversations. Young people mm -hmm. tell us time and time again that, you know, it's the adults in their lives that are scared of the S word. Um, and there's a lot of kind of fear around talking about suicide with young people in case, you know, they catch suicide or we're putting in um, ideas in the minds of young people. And there's actually no evidence to support that. In actual fact, talking about suicide is such a protective factor um, when it does come to, to young people. So I suppose I would echo there as well what Em said in the terms of, you know, if you are a parent or if you are an adult and you do have a young person who has been impacted by suicide, talk to them about it. Um, you know, there is fear as well, like Em said, that saying the wrong thing is a problem, but in actual fact, saying nothing is worse. Um, and that would be our advice is just actually have that conversation. Thanks, Louise and Em. Yeah, it seems like, uh, you know, the power of communication, the, the, what, that's what we're calling for here and, and maintaining yeah. those open lines of communication to be able to just be there for the young person. Um, it's like a very, very powerful thing. Yeah. I've got another question uh, coming through on, mm -hmm. um, for both of you, I guess, the benefits of using social media to um, in prevention of youth suicide. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll jump in there and, and just say that, you know, I suppose throughout the campaign or throughout the Chat Safe campaign, we've learned that we, based with, like, in partnership with our social media accounts, we managed to get a lot of information out to, like I said, over 1.5 million young people in a 12 week period. Um, and, you know, I'd like to think that that's a lot of young people who may not have seen any suicide prevention information across that time period otherwise. Um, and, you know, for every young person who does feel a little bit more equipped or a little bit more empowered with some helpful information, that's a whole bunch of other young people that they can help. So I think the benefits of social media in terms of being able to reach a lot of people, in terms of it being a medium that young people seem to trust and they like to see information on, we can make it youth friendly. We involve young people in helping us create that information so that it is meaningful to the others that see it. Um, I just think, you know, a lot of the positives definitely outweigh the, the, the negatives. Great, thank you. Um, I have another question, Emily, for you. Thinking about um, the peer work, so people who work with young people or educators who are in contact with, they, they, they may feel that somebody may, may be needing some support. Um, when you, you can you refer someone to go look you will benefit from this program or how do people go about like this resource exists can we direct young people to engage with peer support programs how, how does that process work it is tricky because peer work while it's kind of gaining popularity and momentum it's not everywhere um mm -hmm. you know thankfully you know headspace does have this peer program but it's not in every headspace center um, and yeah especially the youth peer peer workforce uh, is also you know relatively new when you consider um, other streams of support in the mental health field so it is sort of growing um, but it isn't everywhere but i would say if there is like a service near you or even online especially peer work especially is growing online very rapidly um, if there is capacity and availability for peer work or to access peer work whether it's um, in person, although obviously not at the moment, um, but also online, um, it, it's as simple as being referred to, um, I guess, a clinical stream of support, even easier, because you typically don't need like that formal referral um, just to be tied into that service. So uh, it can be a lot easier to see a peer worker in some in some cases. You don't need that, you know, GP referral um, or referral from a clinician, um, and at, at least. Um, at my Headspace Centre, um, yeah, it, it doesn't need to be tied into other streams of support. So it's really quite accessible for young people, but it's just unfortunate that peer work is still kind of new in the field, that it's not as widespread um, as hopefully maybe one day it will be. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's just about if it is accessible to you and if it is something that you think a young person will benefit from, um, it's as simple as, yeah, kind of just referring them as you would um, to another stream of support, but usually um, quicker and, and easier as well. Great, thank you. We've got many, many questions. <laughs> Keep going through them. Um, here, 
Uh, there's a question about uh, concerns in terms of a young person's identity and how is that kind of protected when we are you know engaging with engaging with engaging with young people via social media um did they mean in terms of like as research participants or in terms of young people who might be sharing their stories does it maybe sharing content and um or or, or you're reaching people for, via social media to yeah. um share some messages um yeah yeah, so I suppose, and I'm like, please let me know if I haven't answered this question properly, but in terms of research participants being involved in some of the work that we do, um, uh, we do not identify any of our participants and they wouldn't be able to be identified through any of our channels. So a lot of our research happens a little bit behind the scenes through direct messaging between us and the participant directly. So there's nothing really done in a group setting. Yeah. And the other thing in terms of like our ethical procedures is that we would never identify or include identifying information in anything that we publish or present on. Um, the other thing is in terms of protecting identity or I, I think in terms of a, from a young person's perspective, you know, the information that we would share or we would encourage in terms of what to post online or what to share online, a lot of that also comes back to being aware of what social media is and how that works. Um, and just some more digital online safety. So things like only sharing what you're comfortable with sharing, knowing that once you press send or submit or post, it could be there forever. Things can be screenshot, things can be read outside of context in terms mm -hmm. of the way it's posted. So also empowering those kind of digital literacy and social media skills um, to accompany the information that a young person posts is really important. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> Thanks, Louise. Um, have time probably for two more questions. Um, one, you both talked about the language and certain languages are helpful, and how we can uh, the chat safe, for example, guidelines provide some helpful uh, alternatives. Someone's asking about uh, another way of saying that someone has attempted suicide. Is there another way? This person uh, works in the courts and sees this writing uh, a lot and would like to uh, educate others and what better ways to, to talk about this, better language to refer to this instead of saying attempted suicide. You can provide some guidelines there. Um, I suppose like the big one for us is like the difference between committed suicide yeah. or um, attempted suicide. Yeah. Attempted, like in terms of what we advocate or what we encourage within the chat safe guidelines, we we don't steer, necessarily steer people away from that language. Yeah. Um, I think we probably feel that there's other much more harmful language that we'd like to educate people on. Um, okay. And how would you, what would you say here? Yeah, you, you kind of touched on it already, Louise, but I think, um, I think attempted in the context of failed attempt is kind of where we distinguish between helpful and unhelpful. So yeah. that connotation of failed being um, kind of a goal to achieve. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah that negative connotation. So I think attempt in itself isn't unhelpful, but in the context yeah. of failed attempt, it can be yeah quite um, quite negative and unhelpful. Um, or unsuccessful, yeah. Unsuc yeah, unsuccessful. yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. Great clarification, thank you. Um, some people are also asking about how they can uh, keep up to date with the latest data, latest research, most up to date resources or programs. Is there, I don't know, a newsletter or some somewhere where people can go <laughs> to find? Yeah. Obviously, we have Origin and, and, and other organisations, but uh, yeah, if you could help people with uh, where, where where to go. Yeah, that's a great question. So in terms of keeping up to date um, with the chat safe resources and with the Origin Week resources, I'm sure Headspace is the same. Anything on that, like we update our websites regularly and we do post some press releases and things like that when um, we do launch a new resource or a, a new handout, things like that. In terms of keeping up to date with the data around suicide, that's a kind of a bit of a topical issue. Um, you know, there is quite a lag or a delay between suicides occurring and suicide data becoming available. Um, and so I know that, again, the um, Centre for Research Excellence, um, alongside the colleagues at Brain, the Brain and Mind Centre, are doing a lot of work in this space, trying to get that data made available more quickly. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, we're not quite there yet. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Lou. Um, Emily, I've got a question for you. 
um, for other young people considering getting involved in youth, youth uh, peer work, how do you become comfortable discussing suicide with young people uh, and other peers? Yeah, it takes a lot of time. Um, yeah, I started sort of started my advocacy journey a few years ago when I volunteered for my local Headspace Centre and through that have gotten involved in um, peer work. I um, started with Origin and a few peer projects there and yeah, I'm now in the peer support role at Headspace Werribee. So it's kind of through um, different projects and um, learning different skills through these projects that I've kind of gotten to this point where um, part of my role is having those conversations with young people. Um, but I've also been fortunate enough to do quite a bit of training as part of my role in terms of, um, yeah, sharing your lived experience, sharing your story um, and learning how to do that meaningfully, appropriately, um, how to do it as well. So a large part of that has come from, from training opportunities, which I'm very grateful for. Um, but yeah, it also comes with practice and sometimes there are situations where you might disclose part of your story that maybe in hindsight wasn't very comfortable to do or you realise wasn't meaningful. Um, so yeah, from that learning how to go about, about it the next time. So there's a bit of failure involved in, in sharing your story, unfortunately. You're learning. Um, parts of it. Um, so it's a lot of practice and knowing that you don't need to share any part of your journey or your, or your story as well, it's entirely up to you whether you want to talk about it or how to talk about it or what parts to talk about. Um, and yeah, that comfort kind of comes with time, um, which isn't always a great answer because, you know, um, mm -hmm. I wish you could wake up and just have the confidence or the skills to do it. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's time and I've also been able to have some relevant educational opportunities as well. So it's a bit of a mixture, um, but definitely time has been the best, the best learning as well. Yeah, great. Thank you, Emily. What have you seen in terms of uh, demand for mental health services? Or do you have any information or data on these and um, what's happening in terms of self-harm and suicide among young people during this period? Yeah, so um, that's a great question um, and it's something we are very interested in in seeing especially how it plays out over the next few years. Um, unfortunately, with the way that the suicide data is recorded and shared, we don't have um, up to date real time data on suicides as they occur. Um, so currently there is no data to support the fact that there have been a rise in suicides um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but like I said in the presentation, we have seen a rise um, a 33% rise in self-harm presentations to emergency departments um, and we do know that self-harm is a number one predictor or sorry a, a high predictor of um, future suicidal behaviour so as we are seeing that rise in self-harm behaviours currently um, we may expect that to translate into higher rates of suicide down the track um, and like I said our colleagues at the Brain and Mind Centre in Sydney have used um, sorry, are using some modelling techniques um, and they do expect up to a 30% increase in suicides over the next five years. Um, and that's when things like job seeker, job keeper and all of those economic and social and financial um, impacts are truly felt. Um, and it's, sorry, in terms of demand, um, we are also aware that Headspace centres and our clinicians at Origin um, are quite overwhelmed with the, the level of demand um, that they are seeing by young people seeking help. Um, and I'm sure Em could speak to this um, better than I. Definitely. I mean, absolutely, there's been a um, really substantial increase in demand, um, at least particularly speaking for my centre, um, but I know the other Headspace centres in the northwest of Melbourne that are parented by Origin have seen a similar increase in demand. Um, so that's definitely been one of um, the things to come out of COVID. Um, but it's definitely not, I guess I wouldn't say it would be a, a massive deterrent for young people or for anyone wanting to seek help. Um, it's just, you know, the nature of, of things at the moment, but absolutely there's been, yeah, massive uh, demand on um, our access team and allied health professionals, 100% um, um, with everything going online. And just to, to jump off that as well, um, massive demand put on online telephone services as well in the past few months um, with COVID-19 escalating. So yeah, that's 100% been uh, felt around the mental health space. Yeah. 
And Lou, you were saying that the, the we don't have real time data on suicide. So it, what's the lag from like official statistics when the data is collected? When do we get to see that data? How old is it basically? Yeah, it, there is quite a lag. So for instance, the 2019 causes of death data was released last Friday. So what was that like the 25th, 26th of October, 2020? Mm -hmm. um, and so the lag can be anywhere between a year, two years at times. Um, and again, a lot of our colleagues are, you know, pushing and advocating for a more real-time approach to suicide and, and um, arguing for the worth in terms of rolling out interventions in a timely manner, getting out um, information across communities as suicides have occurred, um, because the longer we leave a postvention approach, the less effective it will be. Yeah, definitely. Um, the other question that we, um, you don't have time to look at before is in terms of contagion, suicide contagion, and, and what advice could you give uh, to address this risk on social media? Yeah, um, and that's another good question. So I know I spoke in the presentation about harnessing the positives of social media um, and that, you know, social media can be used for good and that there's a lot of really good things that we can do, but we can't shy away from the fact that social media can also cause harm. Um, and we are upfront about that in the chat safe guidelines, especially when information is shared in an unhelpful or unsafe way. So unhelpful and unsafe reporting um, of suicide is quite harmful and increases the risk of the people who see it. Um, we know that social media is also a place where misinformation or rumors or gossip can spread. Um, we also know that, you know, once something is on social media, it's there, like it can be there for a long time. Um, and so we might be, um, seeing it more than we would in a conversation offline. Um, and so in terms of managing contagion across social media, I think it's really important that we're all aware of what is harmful. So things like misinformation, you know, talking about methods or, you know, sharing photos or information about locations of suicide, all of that is really harmful and unsafe. And so the more people that are aware of what's harmful, the more I suppose we can have people that are able to pull down or report that content if they see it um, in terms of trying to keep social media a safe space. So yeah, if it, is if it is harmful or it is unsafe, the risk of contagion does increase. But the more people who are equipped with those, with that knowledge, I suppose, the more people that are kind of hoping or trying to make social media a safer space. And, and there are some specific guidelines on the chat safe um, about that, right? Yeah, so there's information within the chat safe guidelines about what constitutes safe or unsafe communication or posts. Um, and there's also information in the clusters resource or the chat safe guide for communities around what sorts of information they should be pushing out and what sorts of information they should be monitoring their posts for and removing or reporting. So um, the other thing there is the chat safe guidelines does educate um, all social media users, I suppose, on what tools are available to them through the social media platforms. So things like reporting content, um, hiding, snoozing, removing followers, things like that. Um, those kind of technological tools at our disposal to minimise how many people see un unhelpful content. Mm -hmm. And do you find that, do you come across these um, issues in your, in your peer support work? Absolutely. Uh, young people are all across social media, um, almost 24-7. So it's not about removing that from their every day. It's about cultivating it to be something safe and positive and helpful. So, I mean, we're never going to win the battle against social media, I don't think, but um, we can definitely make them safer spaces. So I think that's the battle we're choosing to focus on, um, at least with the chat safe guidelines. Great. Right. And our last question for today, um, it's about whether you know about specific statistics or, or, or data information on self-harm and suicide behaviours among people from refugee or migrant backgrounds. Um, that's another really good question. Um, and again, it's not a group that we have managed to engage well yet with the chat safe work that we do or with the work that we do within our team. Um, we would acknowledge that um, refugee or migrant youth are at a greater risk um, and do have some risk factors um, that do need some special consideration. But um, in terms of am I aware of data um, in terms of self-harm and suicide um, behaviour, I'm not, to be honest with you. I'd love to know if there is. Um, but again, 
yeah, there would be some really unique risk factors there that are worth exploring. Um, yeah. And again, I think it's something that, you know, we could do down the track with ChatSafe in terms of trying to get out the message to as many young people from as many different backgrounds as possible. Um, it's not super related, but, you know, one of the projects we're currently running is with culturally and linguistically diverse groups across northwest of Melbourne. And there we're trying to do things like getting resources um, and content in the languages that are spoken within the home so that we're trying to kind of promote conversations between young people and their parents. Um, I know schools in the Northwest have struggled to send home information around mental health, self-harm and suicide um, if parents don't speak English. So there are that, that kind of works being done, but in terms of collecting the data at this stage, no. In your experience, Emily, have you come across yeah. working with um, migrant uh, refugees and, and migrant young people? Yeah, uh, so in Werribee, in the Wyndham region, um, yeah, refugee, migrant, um, culturally, linguistically diverse people, particularly young people, make up a really significant part of the community. And we've done a little bit of research in that area to inform some of the community work and the school work that we're doing um, in our Windsor region. So we've definitely seen the numbers and we, we recognise how much of the community are from those um, demographics and those groups of people. So um, it's a massive part of our community. Um, and like Lou said, there isn't a lot of information, particularly about mental health that are in those accessible languages for those communities and families, um, particularly in the, in the school setting. So yeah, we also recognize that's a massive gap um, in, in our work and in our, um, in our community um, so that hopefully we can um, do a little bit better at in the future. Great. Well, thank you, Emily. Thank you, Louise, for um, hanging around and uh, responding to a few more questions. But before we, we say goodbye to our audience, if you could quickly uh, just give us a takeaway message, um, just something for uh, for people to, to think about. Em? Ooh. I would say, uh, I, I sort of mentioned this um, in what I said before, but um, not being afraid of of silence or uncomfortable opportunities to talk with a young person. Um, let them find the right words, let them find comfort in physical space, emotional space to tell you what's going on um, and be be there for them if and when they're ready to have that conversation. Um, yeah, sil silence can be really powerful. Uh, you just sort of have to sit in it for a little bit sometimes, um, but it can be a great opportunity to, to be in a moment with a young person and uh, yeah, allow them to share what's going on. Thanks, Sam. That's really good. Um, I would probably say, you know, if we think back to the different types of interventions that we run um, and try to reach young people through, I would say it's really important that we involve young people in the creation of those, in the evaluation of those, and in the rollout of those. You know, if we want something to have impact and if we want something to be meaningful for those people, they need to be included every step of the way. So we need to stop kind of making um, decisions on their behalf or, um, you know, assuming that we know what's going to work best and start involving the people that have the experience. Right. Thanks, Lou. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. And uh, we'll... Uh, make sure you sign up for the CFCA news so you can receive the link and, and, and have a look at the entire um, at the whole session. Thanks for joining us and thanks Emily and Lou for your uh, insights. Thanks everyone. Awesome. Thanks for having us.